Yeah. Yeah, the sound makes a huge difference. And the planning is enough, obviously. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, no, I think it's the lighting is good. Margaret said she was going to come. Margaret said she was going to come. I told her we're going to start later, so I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so, I I think shall we get? I think we get. Oh, it worked earlier. It worked earlier. Hello. It's green. I wonder if it's muted. Let's try again. Good evening. No? It was on earlier. It was, it was on earlier. I didn't think I. But you should someone then shut out the system after Max. Yeah, probably maybe oh, someone did. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know, it's always a one problem this week and then another one next. Next week is going to be perfect. <laughs> Okay, yes? No, yeah, someone must have switched. Perfect. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Ulrike McGregor, and I welcome you to the co cathedral of St. John the Evangelist. Tonight is our third lecture on reflection on Advent and Christmas through art. I would like to begin with a brief summary of what we have discovered so far in our Advent and Christmas series. In our first reflection three weeks ago, we were reminded, particularly through St. John the Baptist, the importance of preparing our body, mind, and heart for the coming of Christ. Similarly, at the Annunciation, through Mary's unconditional and repeated yes to God's will, which is often referred to as her fiat, she led the way for the coming of Christ into our lives. 
In our second reflection last week, we explored the often understated role of St. Joseph, who unambiguously supported Mary through his devotion, unwavering practical support and courage. And as we have established during our discussion, St. Joseph was crucially important for Mary to be the bearer of the Christ child. Today, as we are celebrating the Feast of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary, I would like to devote our reflection tonight to Our Lady. We will reflect on three most beautiful depictions of the Virgin Mary. The first image is the Immaculate Conception by Giovanni Battista Tipolo. The second is the Visitation painted by studio assistants of Raphael. And the third image is of Our Lady of Guadalupe on the tilma or cloak of Saint Juan Diego from 1531. There are endless topics to discuss about Mary, but with tonight's works of art, I will touch upon three qualities From the first moment by a single grace and privilege of Almighty God was free from every stain of original sin. This original sin was brought upon us through the sin of the first man, Adam, who disobeyed God in eating the forbidden fruit and, in consequence, transmitted his sin and guilt by heredity to his descendants. The doctrine says that human beings do not commit original sin, but rather inherit it from the fall of Adam and Eve. With this brief introduction, I would like to begin to explore our first work of art of this evening. It is the Immaculate Conception by Giovanni Battista Tipolo, painted in 1767 and 68. Tipolo was born in Venice in 1696 and died in Madrid in 1770. He was perhaps the greatest Italian Bobo painter, was famous throughout Europe as an unrivaled, prolific fresco painter splendid craftsman in Venice. Tipolo married a noble woman, Mary, the sister of two prominent Venetian painters, Francesco and Giovanni Guardi, and they had nine children. Two of his sons, Giovanni Domenico and Lorenzo, were also artists, and the former was a particularly prolific engraver. In his early and mid Tipolo was most active in Venice and in northern Italy, creating magnificent works of art for the Venetian nobility, churches, and convents. In 1761, Tipolo was called to Madrid by Charles III of Spain to decorate the firm room at the new royal palace. With the assistance of his Two sons, Domenico and Lorenzo, Tipolo decorated the palace reception halls between the summer of 1762 and 1766. Afterwards, he desired to remain at the Spanish court, 
which led him to accept other royal commissions as a chamber painter. This majestic image, immaculate conception, was part of a cycle of seven altarpieces for the new royal church of Saint Pascal at Aranjuez. Commissioned by Charles III in 1767. However, the paintings were removed uh, to a, a, a adjacent convent in already 1775. Charles wasn't too crazy about the site. <laughs> and um, it is now in the Museo del uh, Prado in the French of Spain. The subjects of all the art pieces reflected some of the most important devotional practices of the Franciscan order. Devotion to the Eucharist, to the Christ child, and to the purity of the Virgin Mary. As you consider our first painting tonight, I would like to quote Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, as we also just heard in the Mass of the Church. I quote, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And with this, I would like to start to explore this painting together. Um, and I open, I open up with a, with a general question, what do we see? We don't need to jump right into um, interpreting what we see. Or, um, I think if we just start describing what we see, um, maybe how it makes us feel, even, um, if we think it's beautiful. And so usually I tend to suggest that we read a picture from right to left or left to right because kind of <coughs> the painters tend to do the story. But I think that this picture, the central message is an essential of the painting. So it's our blessed Virgin Mary. And I have included uh, a couple of images where I kind of zoomed in and I can go back and forth. So first of all, we see a beautiful face and there she wears a crown of stars. And then you have a bodyguard above her. Um, if we go back, if we now kind of look down here, and then cut this out, again we see an angel carrying the white lily. We have seen that symbol before. Um, and then on the other side, so and then she's standing on the globe. And then here it is. Uh, it's a serpent, and the serpent is holding an apple. And actually, I just want to point this out, and we can talk about this a little bit later. Um, it's probably very hard to see. There's a mirror down here. So, is that anyone who would like to start with? Yeah, it's almost a little bit like a dragon. Oh, yeah. 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 So, we very much, um, I would like to work towards um, the idea of this Mary as the new, the new Eve. Um, as we remember in, in the story of uh, Genesis, the old Eve picked the apple from the tree and she gave it to Adam. And he took it, and that was the downfall of mankind. In this image, and with the, with the coming of the new Eve, she stands, she stands on the serpent. So she crushes um, the serpent. And so therefore, she is the co-redeemer together with Christ. Um, she crushes
crushes the sin, she, she takes it away from, from the earth again. <laughs> Yes, oh yeah, and she, 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 um, and I think she knows what she does. I mean, she knows, she's uh, taken part in saving mankind. Um, she doesn't look up quite often if you see other um, depictions of the Immaculate Conception. She goes up to heaven. Here she kind of, um, she doesn't look down, but her gaze is down. Um, so kind of, someone on the, on the um, serpent, I think she's very, very aware of what she's doing. And then um, we hear um, this is also a reference to the book of Revelation, um, where it says, and I have to go just to be correct here. Um, it's Revelation 12, verse 1 and 2. A woman falls with the sun, with the moon under her feet. And hung up her head from twelve stars. Um, so in this one you can see nine, but I think it's because there are the other stars are a little bit they would be behind her head. But she, um, and she is standing on the moon. It's a it's a crescent. And the crescent of the moon is quite often um, an ancient symbol of her um, chastity. Um, but it's also we can interpret it as the weaning of the Old Testament, but also the, the coming of the of the New Testament. I think we should constantly in our mind um, have jumped from the Old Testament into the New Testament, and she is kind of in the middle of it. Um, she's she's helping to move away from the from the old. Which brought us down to into the new world um, and supporting the new, the coming of, of Christ. That image is one that we heard when you talked about, you know, standing on the moon and the stars. And I think it's interesting how children sometimes hear that. I, my daughter, who was here two weeks ago, was probably five. And one night, we have a window in our stairwell, and you could see, thank you, uh, we saw the sickle moon and the stars. And Emma, come here, look how pretty this is. And she looks at it, and she goes, I think Mary's standing on top of that. <laughs> I'll never forget that. I still tease her about it. But, you know, the, just the way children incorporate some of the stories they hear in our scriptures and put their own which I thought was interesting, and we heard it also in the, um, in the gospel today, the overshadowing, um, Mary was overshadowed during, her, uh, during the Annunciation, and when I was looking at this painting, I thought all these kind of clouds and the, um, you know, the clouds and, and kind of maybe like almost like a dust cloud that was, is about to envelop her and kind of overshadowing her, to kind of use that word. Um, and I think we also need to talk about that she is standing on the globe. She's standing on the earth. Um, and it symbolizes her triumph over the fallen world. 
Um, and as I mentioned, she, she takes on the role as the redeemer for humankind. Yeah, she's. Yeah, she's. She, that's supposed to be the world. So I, and that's I, so at that point, it was yeah it was just, because Columbus had traveled across the ocean and yeah. Again, I would, would put that a little bit to artistic freedom. Um, I, it very much suppo is supposed to depict the serpent, um, referring back to the reading of Genesis um, and the, the serpent that um, led Eve to, to take the, the apple. So standing on evil and Yes, so she, she, she's crushing it. She, she takes it away, um, finally. I mean, so we, we still are born with the original sin, um, but she's coming in and she, she can't take away the original sin and we, since it, it will be with us, but she kind of prepares the way for... Um, Bringing in, bring Jesus into our lives, um, and then having kind of a, a second chance, um, because through Jesus we are redeemed and um, will hopefully gain access to heaven eventually. For me, it seems like the, the artist took that liberty of depicting the serpents, like in the Book of Revelations, when we talk about the dragons coming. Right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, so that's a it's a palm tree. A palm. So as a victorious a sign of her victory. But your um, comment is a very interesting. Um, Tipolo made couple mm -hmm. a, a number of similar images, and in one of his images he had included uh, Saint Michael. Uh, again, further referring to. The, the, um, to the reading in Genesis and the, the, the fight um, afterwards. I'm fascinated by her face. Okay. It helps with the uh, live stream if we speak in the microphone. I'm fascinated by her face because usually you see Mary with a, a peaceful, graceful face. Here she's got control over this dragon. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. I think yeah. Um, I very much agree. Uh, she's with conviction. She kind of did this. Yes. Um, so what's up with the mirror? So the mirror, uh, it is to. She can look into the mirror and will see a perfect being because she is the immaculate conception. Virgin Mary, and she was conceived without sin. If we would look into the mirror, we would see our sins. So it's, a, it's kind of a play on, on her uh, sinlessness. Yeah. 
And I think, again, there's just a, to kind of finish this off and we need to move on to our second um, picture, it's, it's the fruit, it's the, the play on, on the, the Old and the New Testament and, and her different roles um, that she plays. And because in the Garden of Eden, the old Eve uh, listened to the fallen angel and disobeyed God. And she became the cause of Adam's fall. In the Annunciation, if we think about that, the new Eve, she believed the words that were spoken by the holy angel. She obeyed God. And so she became the mother of the one who would save us from the fall of Eve, from Adam. So Mary's obedience reversed Eve's disobedience. Thus, Mary is the new Eve for the new creation in Christ. And I, um, I also, with this, because we will move on to our second painting, and just to keep in mind, so in, um, it's the fruit. So, and when we think about, when we say the Hail Mary, we talk about um, the fruit of your womb. So again, there's, there's that uh, connection, as we will see with our next um, painting. With our second painting, we will expand our, on, on our understanding of Mary and recognized her also as the new Ark of the New Covenant. Our second painting is The Visitation, which was commissioned by Giovanni Broccanio for his family chapel at the Church of San Silvestre di Aquila, east of Rome, and it was painted circa 1517. This work was drawn, we kind of talked about this for the, the preparatory work for this final painting was done by Raphael, the master artist of the high Italian Renaissance. However, the picture was painted by his assistants, Giuliano Romano and or Giovanni Francesco Penny, though it's not quite clear which one or maybe as a collaboration um, they painted it. Romano worked with Raphael first as a pupil and then as an assistant and was involved in the decoration of the Raphael rooms at the Vatican which was completed in 1519. They had also collaborated with Giovanni Francesco Penny, so that's where the connection, and it's not quite clear who of them, or as I say, maybe both of them painted this together. As you consider our second painting tonight, I would like to quote Luke chapter one, verse 41 to 43. And this is the gospel that is read on the fourth Sunday of Advent in the liturgical year at C. So it was read last year at Advent. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the infant leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, cried out in a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how does it happen to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So, um, again, this is very much a picture that you, it's right on in the middle, um, even though it is a little bit in the background and we can talk about this. Um, we have Mary herself who's pregnant and we have her cousin, Elizabeth, uh, who's, all, who's pregnant with St. John the Baptist. Um, it's quite clear Mary is depicted much younger um, and Elizabeth's older to kind of underpin the miracle that she still was able to um, bear a son uh, in older age. And then, and then here in the background, and I kind of zoomed into this, 
um, Raphael expanded on the story of the visitation, he also included um, kind of the, the life of St. John and Jesus, and then St. John is baptizing Jesus in the uh, river of Jordan. So already kind of foreshadowing um, what's happening to these two um, babies that are still in the womb. And then I thought this was really quite interesting. We also have God the Father in the painting itself. Um, he's being supported by two angels. And maybe just get started with this because I thought it was quite interesting. When I looked at this, I thought I have seen that kind of depiction of um, God the Father before. And I don't, does anyone want to give a guess? Have you, can you remember that we, that you have seen it somewhere? No? I thought, I looked at it and said, this looks awfully familiar. And then I put them side by side. And sure enough, because Michelangelo painted the Sistine Chapel around 15, 1512, 1515. And I kind of mentioned that before, Raphael and Michelangelo were rivals, and they both lived in Rome. But of course, I'm sure, and then Raphael was painting um, the rooms in, in the, um, at the Vatican. So I'm sure he kind of snuck <laughs> through the Sistine Chapel and kind of was, looked at what Michelangelo was up to. And so I think they were back and forth, they were feeding on each other a little bit. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely think um, Raphael looked at Michelangelo's work with that. So I thought that was a kind of a neat touch. But let us come back to our main figures. Um, I think Raphael chose to depict Mary um, kind of much further ahead in her pregnancy than she should be. But I, I think he wanted to give Jesus a, a greater presence in, in the painting. Um, and then also we, we talk a, a lot about her cloak, right, the blue color. Um, and also I thought it, it's, it's very interesting how Raphael designed how the cloak, um, how she, Mary is wearing the cloak. Um, and continuing with, with our kind of thought process, jumping between the Old Testament and the New Testament, um, I think he, and the idea of that Mary is the, the new ark of the new covenant, um, there's a reference in the second book of Samuel uh, where the ark is described. So God left very specific instructions how the ark was to be built and decorated. Um, and he speaks about that a, a blue cloth should be wrapped over it. And I think um, Raphael took that and again because we are seeing, or we are we understanding Mary as the new ark because she is carrying the, the new redeemer. She's carrying Jesus Christ in her. Um, she's carrying the word made flesh. because if we, sorry to jump, so if we think of what is in the ark in the Old Testament, right? What are the three things that are in there? It's the, the manna, the, the bread. So Christ will become the bread of life. Um, there are the, it's the Ten Commandments and the Staff of Aaron. So it's the, the, the Word made flesh. Um, so it's, it's the three parts of the, the old ark. And now Mary kind of is the perfect vessel to carry uh, and to represent the new ark. Um, I need to keep track of. Um, and then, um, quite often, um, scholars also make a comparison 
with the um, it's all it's, it's um, in the old in the Old Testament where it's described uh, when David brings the ark he the, the ark was lost and then he finds it and then he brings it back to Jerusalem and there are a couple of descriptions which are quite interesting that are very closely mirrored in the New Testament. So in the Old Testament, it says, King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And in the, in the New Testament, as we just heard, the infant leapt in Elizabeth's womb. And I think also, I mean, that's maybe a little bit too far, but she, she could either say she's walking or um, they are all, they're kind of, they're very light on their feet. I mean, that's maybe pushing the interpretation a little bit, but I thought they were kind of light on their feet as well. Um, and then there's a, another part in, in the Old Testament, and it says, um, when, the, when the ark was brought up, um, they, were, they were shouting, I mean, they were celebrating. And um, in the New Testament, we just heard that Elizabeth cried out with a loud voice. So again, it's kind of this um, constant comparison between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and really um, cementing the idea that Mary is the, the new Ark of the New Covenant. And the last one is, um, David asks, how can the Ark of the Lord come to me? And then we just heard that um, Elizabeth basically asked the same question. So with the, with the Immaculate Conception, um, God prepared a per perfect vessel to bring his son of, the Son of God back into the world. Um, it's almost more perfect than anything probably we could have, or one could have prepared. Um, so she is the, she's the perfect vessel to carry um, Christ into the world. And I, just to read something out, um, Mary generously accepted the mediate, to mediate the incarnation, placing her body of God's disposition. She, the mother of the church, carries the entire church in her womb. She, the Ark of the New Covenant, houses a treasure more precious than Moses' stone tablets of old. And she, the morning star, shines in the blackness before the blazing sun rises in the east, dawning a new day. And I, I thought so too, we kind of, um, I think it's early morning, we kind of see the sun coming up, shining through the, the sky. And all these images are so beautiful. I think Mary is heavenly beautiful. Um, we can't um, think of anything else. So just in, with this, um, I would like to then go on to our third painting. And it is um, Pope St. John Paul II uh, used a similar description, um, kind of the star, and he described Our Lady of Guadalupe as the star of the new evangelization. The image of Our Lady of Guadalupe on the tilma, or a cloak, of St. John Diego is located at the Basilica of Our Lady in Mexico City. And Father Mann referred to Our Lady of Guadalupe during his homily on Sunday. And we actually have a beautiful painting of the image um, here at St. John's. I will just briefly summarize, um, or give a quick summary of the four apparitions of Our Lady of Guadalupe and how the image came about. Between December the 9th and the 12th, 1531, just a few decades after Christopher Columbus arrived in the New World, Mary, the mother of God, appeared three times to a humbled Aztec who had been baptized as Giran Diego. 
the apparitions occurred on the hill of Tepeyac, which is now part of Mexico City. Our Lady requested Juan Diego to be her special messenger and asked the local bishop to build a church in her name on the hill. She provided proof of their encounters for a skeptical bishop in the form of three signs. The first one, Juan Diego's uncle, who was gravely ill, was healed and she also appeared to him. Juan Diego was able to collect fresh roses blooming in December on the hill of Tepeca. And a, a, a miraculous image of the Virgin Mary herself was imprinted on Juan Diego's tilma. And just to clarify, the, a tilma is a traditional cloak worn by the Aztec people of Mexico, and it was made out of a cactus fiber. So it's just kind of a, a very simple wrap that they would throw around them. And what happened, so she had appeared to him and made the request for him to ask for, this, for the church. And of course the bishop didn't believe him. Um, so, and, but she persisted, so she came back to him again and again and asked him, you need, you need to build a church for me. And so the bishop asked Juan Jago to, to give him proof. And so first of all, he, he picked the roses and um, the lady herself arranged the roses in his, in his tilma and he was carrying it supposedly like this. And then he went to the bishop and he opened it up to show the roses and this image of her was on his cloak. Um, and this cloak, is most magnificent. Um, it was actually just to uh, just mention a few things. Pope St. John Paul II was greatly devoted to Our Lady of Guadalupe. Um, in January 1797, he made his first pilgrimage of four or five. I mean, so he, he had gone back many times to Mexico to consecrate his papacy to her. He stressed her evangelistic role at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome on the 450th anniversary of her apparitions. In 1990, Pope St. John Paul II visited Mexico again and beatified Juan Diego, and he canonized him in July 2002. And we celebrate Juan San Juan Diego's feast day tomorrow, December the 9th. And then the feast day of Our Lady of Guadalupe is on December the 12th. And it's over 20 million people a year visit the Basilica, uh, which is now situated on the very same hill uh, on which she appeared. The Basilica in Mexico City is the most visited marine shrine in the world and the second most visited Catholic church in the world, just after St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Oh, sorry. There you go. So there she is. I'm sorry. <laughs> and as we consider our third image of tonight, I would like to quote Pope St. John Paul II. I quote, I would like to turn my thoughts to Our Lady of Guadalupe, star of the first and the new evangelization of America. To her I entrust the Pilgrim Church in Mexico and the American continent. And I fervently asked her to guide her children so that they will enter the third millennium with faith and hope. And has anyone had the opportunity to, to see her? Have you been, oh, oh wow, many people, nice. So you can actually tell me more than <laughs> I can tell you. How is it? I mean, I unfortunately haven't seen it. How is it? It's beautiful. Microphone. 
Okay. You can't hear me, Monsignor? <laughs> no, but the live stream can't hear you. Great. Right. So in order to see the, the tilde, you have to go behind the altar and there is a beggar belt okay. that you step on. Yeah. Oh yeah, I can imagine. I mean, 20 million a year, <laughs> that's a lot of people. <laughs> There's a sense of awe standing before something like that because it's so um, authentic. Mm -hmm. It's not a rendition. It's the actual image mm -hmm. from our lady. And it's, it's, it is awe-inspiring to be there, even, even in the brief time that you're being transported across in front of it. Yeah. And along with that is the number of people that come on their knees and are the pilgrims and they, they go through this whole court path to get to the, the basilica itself. And that's also an awesome sight to see. Uh, some people are somewhat crippled or people are helping them, but it's on their knees mm -hmm. and do this. Wow. And then also when you hear mass in the our lady is right there as well. So we do have um, that experience of her present during the whole Eucharist. Yeah, no, I, I wish I, I, hopefully that could be in, in our next term. <laughs> <laughs> Did you win? What color is the actual oak? Oh, sorry? What color is the actual Oh, the cloak. It's a, it's a blue-greenish color. And it's, it was reserved uh, for the high-ranking um, people of the Aztecs uh, at that point, at that time. Um, do you want to? Well, I was going to say that I have been to twice, and the first time was the original it was older, and the picture was almost like ground up, like you could walk by up and stand right next to it. It was under glass, but you could, it was very powerful. And then several years later, I went back and they built a new cathedral, and the picture is above the altar, so it's, it's not, um, I was kind of sad, because before you'd be really close to it, and, and now you have to look up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I can, and there are so many um, additional miraculous parts to her. Uh, as I kind of, the reason I love giving these presentations is actually I learned so much while preparing for it. And I, I knew a couple of things, but um, there are, a large number of miraculous um, qualities to this image. Um, it has been many times, obviously, scientists have looked at it, and they cannot find the colors on the tilma itself are not believed to be any um, chemical that we, we know that exists for us, so um, no one really can pinpoint what is the color that the image is made of. And I think that the, right from the start, so these cloaks, these tilmars, are made out of this cactus fiber, and usually they disintegrate after 15, 20 years. And so, but this one exists for, you know, soon 500 years and it's in, in pristine condition um, and no insects or no degradation has been found on it which is um, remarkable um, and so just a couple of things 
um, that I have um, come up across. And just because we, we talked about the crescent moon before, um, and then kind of the, the sun, sun blazing, and those were two, so the Aztecs, when the, the Spanish conquered New Me or Mexico, uh, the indigenous people were Aztecs, and they believed in multiple gods, um, which was actually pretty tough. Uh, they still believed in human sacrifice, and I read a couple of numbers of the sacrifices they made. It's mind-boggling. Um, however, so and then the, since the, the, the Spanish was the very Christian, very much Christian, and they wanted to convert the, Sp the, the Mexicans, and it didn't quite go so well. Um, when the apparition happened in, in 1531 and word spread, within roughly eight to 10 years, more than nine million indigenous Mexican converted to Catholicism, which is amazing. Um, just because it was also, they could, they could read, they were able to read this image. Um, since they were believed, they believed in um, different gods, they believed in the god of the sun, they believed in the god of the moon. Um, but Our Lady, she was standing on the moon, she was standing in front of sun, so she was stronger, she was more powerful than the gods that they had believed in so far. And, um, and she also came as an indigenous woman. I mean, she came as one of them. And I think that also her, her skin is a little bit darker. Uh, so I think that really much spoke also to the indigenous um, people. Um, the, one interesting thing, so the, her cloak, we see the eight point stars. And scientists, again, have found that it actually depicts um, exact constellation of the sky that was, would have been visible on December the 12th, 1531. Um, so those are, there are many aspects to this image. I mean, it's not a painting, it's an image that are miraculous. Um, And um, it also survived multiple attacks. Um, in the 18th century, someone was cleaning parts of it and dripped an acid over the image, but it wasn't damaged. Um, there's just a, a little bit um, here kind of on the side, but the actual image wasn't damaged at all. Um, and then, that, and then uh, later on, I think it was during the Second World War, the image was hanging lower, uh, and it was right with the altar, and someone had placed a bomb in the flower arrangements. Uh, and the bomb exploded and created great damage. There's actually an image of a, a kind of a golden uh, candle stand, which is completely bent over. It's now in the museum. But again, uh, uh, the image of Our, our, our Lady uh, was not damaged um, by, by this attack. Um, so it's, there's so many miraculous um, parts of it. Uh, supposedly, ophthalmologists looked at her eyes and they can see what one would have, if I would look at you, that's what we can see in her eyes. There's um, miniature, humans in her eyes, really as a reflection. And an ophthalmologist did all the, the calculations and it really is depicted as she was looking at um, San Juan Diego and the bishop um, when he presented the roses to her. Um, and just, supposedly they, they felt a heartbeat um, 
and at her tummy. Um, so this, there's a, a black bow on her, on, her, um, on her womb, so she's pregnant. That's the sign for her pregnancy. And if they put a stethoscope on it, they could hear a heartbeat of 115 beats per minute, and that's the heartbeat of a, of a baby. Um, so a lot of um, aspects that are hard to explain and just miraculous. And I think that's the reason why she has drawn so many people um, into, into the Catholic faith. And she still does. I mean, she now is becoming the patroness of um, the Philippines. Um, and, she, so she, and, and I think within North America, more and more people um, really recognize her and, and venerate her. So. I think when you were talking about uh, the conversion of the 9 million people, it really struck me growing up. My parents were from Mexico. And you know, we weren't super religious growing up. But Our Lady, La Vida de Guadalupe, was always, I mean, she, she's as much a religious uh, figure for Mexico as she is a cultural one. Mm. So you can find, I mean, lots of people who don't go to Mass who wouldn't call themselves Catholic, um, and just have, have this deep affection for La Vida de Guadalupe. Um, and so you can, I, us growing up, we, we would go to church, we would but my mom always had us pray the rosary. She'd make us kneel if we would go to church we, as kids, and I hated this at the time, but she would make us kneel all the way to the front of the altar on December 12th, e even though we wouldn't necessarily call ourselves religious. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to our lady, a lot of it was it's a pretty serious thing uh, <laughs> for, for a lot of people in Mexico. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, I mean, there's, uh, we, we, I spoke to a friend of mine, uh, she's Mexican. There's so many celebrations and, and festivities around that time, she was saying, where she lives, in the middle of the night, you hear kind of a happy birthday. So people go around the town and they start singing happy birthday through, through the entire night and they have f feasts and, yeah, it's, it's really, they're embracing her so much, yeah. Yeah, thank you for everyone sharing their experience um, with, with this image. So, thank you very much. Um, So, th so this is the, the, the crescent of the moon. Oh, okay. And then, so this is also kind of an angel. Um, the, the interpretation is that he presents um, mankind kind of um, holding, holding her up or venerating her. I yeah. thought they were horns too. <laughs> They're so dark. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for coming. See you next week for our fourth and last presentation.